Good morning. Oh, come on now. I, I, know, it, I know it's hot and humid and things like that, but let, let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Hey, it's great to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. Listen, if you're a visitor with us uh, here in the congregation, we'd love to have a record of your visit. If you'd please fill out one of these cards for us. Um, we'd, uh, we're not going to hound you with a bunch of information, but we'll trade it for you at the kiosk at the end of the service uh, with a really nice gift. Uh, and it's, we just want a record of your visit so we can send you a little bit of information about the church. If you're watching us at home on the, uh, on the intranet, if you could just tell me who you are and the number of people watching with us, that'd be great. Um, we, we come to church every week with our own baggage, and we all come with our own stressors and our own uh, issues that are going on, and, and, and we come in here, and it's very easy for us to allow those things to really drive the train and in, in how we worship God. And, and sometimes there are things that just... They just come out of nowhere and they catch you. And that happens. And it's very easy to distract from the genuine worship of a true God. Last week I had a ton of stuff on my plate. I finally got it all turned in. I don't know what the grade will be, but I know what my grades are now. And I'm doing pretty good in my class. I feel pretty good about that. And there are other things. You come in, you almost have a wreck coming in. And all those things are there. I'm not asking you to turn those things off as though they don't matter. But what they do have a habit of doing is focusing our attention on those things. And usually what happens is they're usually negative things. And we focus our attention upon the negative things. And then we come to worship God with an attitude that has a very negative approach to it. And then our worship has a negative tone. And so during this time, when I, when I talk to you about pushing these cares and concerns out, I'm not trying to tell you they're not important. I'm not trying to tell you that they're, they're not big, big concerns. But we're here for an opportunity for us to focus in on a God who knows every single hurt, every single worry, and every single concern. And he is sovereign in all of them. And in this time is an opportunity for us to worship his sovereignty in all of those things. Knowing that he has them all squarely within his hands. And so as uh, Brother Robert comes and leads us in our opening prayer this morning, I want you to focus on the things of, of, of worship this week and focus your attention on those things. Brother Robert, if you lead us. everybody let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer father God we come to you with humble and thankful hearts father we are so thankful for this church that you've given us thankful for my brothers and sisters in Christ father we're thankful for a pastor who is on fire to teach your word father we pray that we hear that word today father we're thankful for each and every blessing that you bestow upon us each and every day and they are bountiful Father, we pray that you be with our country during this difficult time. Be with our leaders. May they, may they seek you in the decisions that they need to make first. Father, we surrender this service to you. Know that we love you very much, Lord Jesus, and we're so grateful what you have done for us. For it is in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please rise for responsive reading. My God, I feel it is heaven to please thee and to be what thou wouldst have me be. Oh, that I were holy as thou art holy, pure as Christ is pure, perfect as thy spirit is perfect. These, I feel, are the best commands in thy book. And shall I break them? Must I break them? Am I under such a necessity as long as I live here? Woe, woe is me that I am a sinner that I grieve this blessed God, who is infinite in goodness and grace. Oh, if he would punish me for my sins, it would not wound my heart so deep to offend him. But thou I sin continually, he continually repeats his kindness to me. 
At times I feel I could bear any suffering, but how can I dishonor this glorious God? What shall I do to glorify and worship the best of beings? Oh, that I could consecrate my soul and body to his service without restraint forever. Oh, that I could give myself up to him so as never more to attempt to be my own or have any will or affections that are not perfectly conformed to his will and his love. But alas, I cannot live and not sin. O oh, my angels, glorify him incessantly, and if possible, prostrate themselves lower before the blessed King of heaven. I long to bear a part with them in ceaseless praise, but when I have done all I can to eternity, I shall not be able to offer more than a small fraction of the homage that a glorious God deserves. Give me a heart full of divine heavenly love. Please greet everybody in brotherly love. All right, are we ready to worship this morning? Amen. Let's go ahead and make our way back to our seats where we're going to worship. Of your salvation, and 
let all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh god
great is our God, and all oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Sing it all out. How great is our God. Amen. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Lord, we praise you. You are great. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We love you, God, and we thank you for everything you do in our lives. God, we pray for Brother Ashley as he's about to give us your word that you'll speak through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing for the scripture reading. Genesis 7, 11 through 24, 8, 20 through 22. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils were the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. All right. Looks like the combination to a safe, doesn't it? This thing keeps mysteriously moving forward. Hmm. I'll just mysteriously move it back. All right. So we're in Genesis. We are in chapter 7 and 8. And if you remember what happened... Last week, we were dealing with the state of man and the state of Noah. And we talked about this concept of grace and wrath and glory and justice and how, at times, we force a false dichotomy between these concepts. A lot of times we look at the story of Noah and we see it and we ask ourselves questions like this. Well, what's 15 cubits? Was it a localized flood 
Or was it a global flood? Was, was Noah really the only guy in the, I mean, because there was a movie that came out with the, with the name Noah. You could have just named it Ralph and the Large Boat. Is there nothing, while, you've ever seen the, the things, all the, like the murder mysteries? The story is true, though the names have been changed. Well, in this case, the story was false. The names just weren't changed. Um, and so, and what happens is folks get wrapped around, I'm going to be honest with you, the nonsense of the passage. And the reason why they do is because the heart of the passage is dark. This is a very dark passage. We've been looking at it for several weeks. And it has to do, and here's the thing, is it's a mirror. It has to do with the darkness of what man is. And man to himself is a wicked thing. Well, we don't like to think of ourselves that way. We genuinely struggle with this concept because we bring what we would call the view of temporal good. Well, I'm a, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my time. And, and notice, we, we bring that into the equation. Eve didn't do anything bad. She ate a piece of fruit. And she damned all of us. And you need to understand that concept. She ate a piece of fruit. Well, no, actually, that's not what she did. She disobeyed the command of God. And when you understand that all sin, regardless of how big or small it is, disobeys the command of God, and in so doing, the minute you do so, you are under ban of death, we would sin less. But we don't, we don't really look at it going, ah, God's not going to kill us. Eight people survived this event. Eight people. Everyone else, and the language is totally dark. He wipes utterly. That's Blot is a polite way of saying to utterly wipe from the earth. This also has implications as to where they go upon their death. And I can tell you that they don't go to heaven. And that's the terminology of utterly blot. To wipe thoroughly. Because here's the thing. Where's the punishment then? Noah's the one's punishment. He has to be in the boat for 150 days with four women. Come on. Why do you think the first thing he did was build a vineyard and get drunk? Sorry, ladies. It was just low-hanging fruit, and I picked it. The implications in the spiritual realm is all of them, all of them, none of them go to heaven. That's the implication. This is why it's so dark. It has such a, uh, such a dark implication upon the results of the New Testament. Because this is foreshadowing. This is what happens in the Exodus. In the foreshadowing of the Exodus narrative. And in this event, you see the grace of God. And you're going to see the wrath of God. Poured out instantaneously in this event. And we struggle with this because we earnestly want to go, but, but I'm a good person. Temporally, you are a good person, hopefully. I'd like to think I'm a good person. And my justification for my being a good person temporally is I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't beat my spouse. I don't cheat on my spouse. I don't rob people at gunpoint. I haven't raped anybody. And I certainly don't think I've murdered anybody. I'm a good person. But the fact of the matter is I transgress the law of God every single day and therefore stand under ban of death. The only thing that preserves me from that ban of death, you want to care to guess what that is? The grace of God. The unmerited favor of what God has done for me and not any of the works that I have done. And here we are in a story that brings this point poignantly home because Noah finds grace in the eyes of God, that's chapter 6. And God makes a covenant with Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and his wives. And, sorry, his wife and their wives. Sorry, Noah only had one wife. And he only preserves a remnant. So we pick up in this very dark language. And, and the concept is, look, in this dark language, you, the Old Testament is typically perverted in the way of well, the God of the Old Testament. He's just a wrathful God. He's just a mean and ugly God. Well, yeah. 
if you want to focus in on the parts where he is justified in his actions. See, you need to understand, God's sentence upon these individuals is not because he's capricious. They have all done wickedness from their heart. The text and the argument that God has put forward to the reader in the text is, man's heart is wicked above all things and seeks to do wickedness. Therefore, man is under ban of death. The judge of all the universe has declared man guilty. And in so doing, has the righteous act to execute sentence. Now, we saw his grace in Eve where he didn't wipe man from the earth and restart new. And we saw his grace with Cain where he could have wiped Cain from the earth, but he did not, and he extended that. But now we're to the point now where man is to the point where God has said, that's it. That will demonstrate I am not the created. And that I am the creator. And I am the judge of all the universe. And I will do right. And that right is the proper execution of his justice. And we're going to see that happen here. But you're also going to see the proper execution of his grace. And then you're going to see where he has this grace extended to mankind after this event. So let's, let's, let's look at this. In the 600th year of Noah's life, Noah is not a young man. For those of you that uh, I turned 50 in September, and uh, I, 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 the way I look at it is I've lived over half my life, and, well, that was interesting. And so let's go. No, okay. Noah is 600 years old. He would be looking at me just like Brother Jim would be looking at me and go, 50, yeah, 50. I remember when I was 50. Right, Brother Jim? And Jim's like, wait till you get a little bit older, youngster, right? All of us in this room know, be like, yeah, woo, yeah, you've lived a long time, not. Because when Noah started building the ark, he was in his mid 550s. That's old. That's old by any standard. Some of you have underwear as old as I am. Noah definitely be looking at you like, Mm, 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 mm. Noah begins at a very old age, okay? Uh, on a, uh, Noah's life on the second of the month, on the 17th day of the month, on the day that all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens opened up, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Whew, that's a lot of rain. And on the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons, uh, with them entered the ark, and they and every beast according to their kind, and all the livestock according to their kind, and every creepy thing on the creep upon the earth according to its kind, Whew. and every bird according to its kind. Now you know why the birds go in, right? No, we'll talk about that here in a moment. And every winged creature, and they went into the ark with Noah, two by two, two and two, or two by two, depending on your text. And oh, you can't see that. I can see that, but you can't. Sorry. Um, and they went in two and two, or two by two, of all flesh into the ark in, there, uh, in which the breath of life was in. And those that entered, male and female, that's important, of all flesh went in as God. Notice, notice this phrase. They went in as they wished or God had commanded. That's important because we'll talk about that here. And the Lord shut them in. Well, let's look at this, this in a very simple way. And a lot of this is precursor to coming up into the destruction of the earth. And, and Noah is 600 years old. He's an older man. He's been around for a bit. He's been spending 120 years. Now, think about this. He's been spending 120 years after God said, I'm going to wipe every man out, but I'm going to give you 120 years. Most of us will never live 120 years. And yet, in that time span, he spent the time building this very large wooden thing. And let me help you out. This is the very first time anyone has seen a very large wooden thing that supposedly is supposed to float. This would be like if you were living in a world where all you had were John boats and dinghies and the USS Nimitz rolled up onto your front lawn. You'd be looking at it going, how does metal float? And think about the, the marvel ingenuity of steel floating on water and aluminum floating on water. I mean, I throw wood in a bucket, and it's going to float, but I throw a rod and aluminum in a bucket, what's it going to do? Hello? It's going to sink. I'm sorry, that was a, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. That was a question to you. Um, what do you do with a bar of steel? Throw in a bucket of water. 
and sink. Amazingly, today we can make metal boats float upon the water. And, 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 and while I understand the dynamics of it and the engineering and things like that, it's still just kind of an interesting concept that normally that material would normally go right to the bottom, and yet it floats. And so everyone looking around is seeing this man building this large piece of wood and wondering what it is. And when he says it's an ark, they're going to go basically, what's an ark? And so Noah, for 120 years, has had this time to tell folks exactly what he's doing because you know people are coming to see what Noah is doing because something like this is going to draw a crowd. But notice the crowd stays the crowd. And on that day that the earth breaks forth, uh, the fountains break forth from the deep, and the windows of heaven are open, and rain falls for 40 days. About this time, people are asking me questions of, so do you think that there's like a canopy upon the earth, and, and that broke open, and the water fell, and, and then the, and I was talking with Eric about this, about uh, Pangea, it was all one large continent, and then when the flood came, it ripped apart, and that's all happened there. And, 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 and while those are, those are nice things, let, let me tell you what the text tells me, right? Uh, The fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were open, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days. That's what happened. Now, why is that important? Well, the minute I began doing science, and try not that science and faith don't go together, but what we have to always resist as Christians is use science as evidence for the validity of the text. You need to understand your text is valid without science. It's an objective standard. Science is a subjective standard. You say, how is science a subjective standard? Well, science is based upon empiricism. Essentially, what has happened in times past dictates what will happen in times future. I go back and I flip the light switch off. What will happen? Lights go off. I do it a thousand times. What will happen? All right, if I do it a thousand and one times, what will happen? Will it? Based upon all the past evidence, that is true, right? But that is always a guarantee that it will happen. Because I got a light switch in the house now, I flip it on and I got to replace it, right? And that's called empiricism. While we look at past data, yeah, we can predict some things, we can put things together, but it's only through observation of past things. The text is true without observation of past past things because it has an author that exists in and of himself and reveals in and of himself. And one of the great dangers is when we start adding things to the text that science that we kind of toy with. Oh, they're cool ideas. Look, they help you understand certain things. But a lot of times there are no-joke guys that will actually insert this into the narrative. And when that view is disproven, guess what you do to the text? Disprove the text. In the eyes of the, of the non-believer. Why? Because you've attached biblical uncertainty to biblical certainty and married them together. So this is why when you ask me my opinion on what happened, I'm going to tell you what the text says. And the text says that this happened. Therefore, that's what happened. You want to know, ask God when you get there. I doubt that this will be a big question when you get there. Why? Because God has the right to do as he wills when he executes judgment upon man. And he is giving cataclysmic language here. And we get lost in the point of this passage when we begin toying with things that the passage isn't addressing. See, this is nebulous. Has the passage given very succinct language? Oh, yes. And we're going to see it. Does the language give succinct language here? No, it gives broad, general statements. That's why you translate it broad and general. We'll see the succinct language here in a moment. Now Noah, his sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wives and his three wives and sons entered the ark. Every beast according to its kind, all the livestock according to its kind. So here's the thing. What goes into the ark? Noah and his family. Does anybody else go into the ark except for the Hollywood version? No. What if they really wanted to go in the ark? 
I mean, they really wanted to go on the ark. They've never been in an ark. They would like to be on the ark. What if they wanted to be on the ark? Could they go into the ark? No, they couldn't. What about a third zebra? Just wandered in. Why not? Did God prescribe who goes into the ark? Yeah, he did. By name. That's a key, that's a key feature. By name, he describes who goes into the ark. And then, by species, he describes what goes into the ark. And he only brings how many? Dos, unless you're a clean animal, and then you're seven of you per, which is 14. And every kind go into the ark. Now, why is this important? Well, this is leading up to the grace concept. This is the remnant that God is going to use to repopulate the entire earth. Animal, plant, I was going to say mineral, but minerals are just floating around the water at this time. Animal, plant, human are all in the ark. Everything necessary to regrow. Then Noah went into the ark. And, and, sorry, they all went into the ark. And, and notice this phraseology. We look at this two and two and we go, well, that's neat. They all go in by pairs. Have you ever seen wild animals do anything equally in pairs? Let me ask you this question here. Have you ever seen lions orderly go upon the ark with sheep in front of them? Or, or you know, tigers. Listen, I've, not, I've seen the Tiger King, and I'm not probably going to watch the Tiger My wife and I are probably the only two people in America that have not seen, seen the Tiger King, and we will forever be the two people that have never seen the Tiger King. But imagine... Uh, from what I understand, one of the characters got ate by a tiger or attacked. Imagine trying to load tigers into the ark. What is being specified here is what's going on going into the ark isn't random. There's a supernatural component involved in the animals going into the ark. They're going in in an orderly fashion. They're not trying to eat one another. They're not trying to run from one another. It's not the chaos of kids trying to get off the school bus at the end of the day or adults trying to get in their car and out of the parking lot at the end of the workday. There is an orderly event going on and also a supernatural event in that the meat eaters aren't eating the meat, let alone the eight other walking human sickles that are on the ark. And orderly, they go into the ark. And orderly, by twos, they go into the ark. And all that has breath, male and female, and notice what happens. Went into the ark, how? As God commanded them. This isn't random. This isn't an act of fate. This is an act of decreative will. God commands them and their order of march as they go in. And what happens is we overlook that because we're worried about the size of the boat and how much water is on the earth. I think contend for you that not, since he gives a very little description about that, and yet in the next little bit you're going to see a lot of descriptions. He's more concerned about that than the amount of water upon the earth. And then notice this phraseology. We overlook it. The Lord shuts them in. Noah doesn't swing a door closed and go, hey, listen, uh, last chance. No. And then locks it into side. The door is shut and sealed by the hand of God. God has picked eight people, two of every creature, and seven of the clean, and he's put them in the ark, and then he seals the ark with his power. No one else is getting in. Nothing else is getting in. And God is going to restart with that. That has some deep theological implications. It's the very nature of who God is. And what happens is, about this point, we begin to think, well, that, that's not fair. That's not fair. Let me help you out. They all transgress the law. They all deserve what they're about ready to get. There is nobody about ready to get punished unfairly upon the face of the earth. God is going to execute Righteous judgment on every single person, infant to elderly. That's our hang-up, not the text. 
The flood continued for 40 days upon the earth. And the water increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And the waters prevailed increasingly greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed so mightily. Whew, man, this guy really needs to um, change his, his, his uh, get a thesaurus. Mo Moses needs a thesaurus about him here. Um, so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered, and the waters prevailed above the mountains and covered them 15 deep, cubits deep. Why is that important? Why is that important? The implication to the reader is that the totality of the flood was such that no one could have survived and no bird could have survived save that which was in the ark. In 40 days, a bird has to have some place to land. He has to have something to nest in. He has to have something to reside in. There is none. And so it dies. The water is at such a place that even if man were to make it to the top of the mountain, let's say this is the top of the mountain, he were to stand on his tippy toes, hopefully I don't fall here, and he were to do this for 40 days, he could survive. Now, if this, the implication is there's no possible way that anything other than what's in the ark survives this. This language is to help accentuate the totality of this event. So thorough is the destruction that not even a mountain is capable of being surfaced above the water. We really struggle with this language. Because it makes God look really, really mean. The problem is the people on the earth that get wiped out really, really deserve it. And we struggle with this. And that's where it's at. Notice what it says. It floats, the, the ark floats upon the surface of the water. Now think about this. I mean, you, if you're Noah, this is kind of a new experiment. You have this big hunk of wood that no one has ever put a boat this large into the water at this time. We are spoiled because in our day and age, you can go down to Galveston and you can see massive boats floating around. Again, how aluminum floats upon water, I don't know, but it must be magic, witchcraft. But yet you have this big wooden thing floating upon the water and it's also indicated that there's probably no guidance system within Noah's not navigating because are there any stars in 40 days? No. And so you see the hand of God guiding this boat where he wants it to go. We'll see that here in a moment. And the water prevails covering all the mountains. The totality of the destruction is such that nothing could survive. And this is why I would reject the local flood narrative. Every mountain is covered. Well, the totality of everything is wiped clean from the earth. And how do we know this? Well because I have this verse right here. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock. Now notice the detailed list here and not the detailed list of how the rain came. So which is the most important of the two details? The one with the greater detail. All flesh, so he starts broad, died upon or died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all the swarming creatures, murder hornets. That swarmed on the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land and who's the nostril of the breath of life died. He blotted out. You see the language here is really, really dark. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man, animals. And, and just so you didn't, if you didn't catch it the first time through, let me give you the list in inverted fashion. I blotted out everything that lived upon the face, that was on the face of the ground, man, animals, creepy things, birds of the heavens, they were all blotted out from the earth if you miss that. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. Whew, that's a long time to be on a boat with birds. Notice, the, notice how it breaks down. Really breaks down in this way. All flesh dies, he blotted out, and then the next one should be on the next slide, and they were blotted from the earth. There's, there's your structure. 
And the, the Hebrews are going to make a structure in the text. All flesh dies. Everything's blotted out. The next thing he says is, they were blotted from the earth. That, that's, your, that's your guts, and then he's going to put flesh on the skeleton. All flesh died. Anything that lived, died. Let me tell you what the all flesh is, should you miss that. Birds, livestock. In this verse, you are going to see the totality of wrath and judgment, but then you are also going to see grace. Why, why, how do you see that? Well, all that is wicked dies. And he could have left it there. That's all he needs to say. We should get all. But, but here's the problem with that. We usually struggle with the all thing. And then he goes to the next step. He blotted out. Who is the referent of the he? God blots out. God blots out every living thing that's on the face of the ground not because he's mean, but because he is the divine judge of the universe. And he destroys all that is on the ground. Man, creepy things, birds. And notice what the text says next. And right here, this really kind of encapsulates the whole argument. And here's where you see the wrath of God and the grace of God. The judgment of God and the glory of God. And all intertwined together in one section. They were all blotted out. Only Noah was left and his sons. See, in the extreme wrath of God as he pours out upon the earth, you see the extreme wrath of, God, of the grace of God in that he saves eight people. He saves two of every kind. He provides for a means for those eight people to escape the judgment that is to come. And they were there and they go through the whole thing. And we're going to see how Noah responds to God's grace and his, and, his, and his actions. And notice what the text says next. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and the livestock that were in the ark. Now we have a shift in language. You have this absolute darkness over here about the destruction of all humanity. And then you have this shift in language where he talks about Noah. God made a wind blow upon the earth, and the water subsided, and the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, and the rain from the heavens, uh, sorry, and the rains receded from the earth continually. I'm going to have to read over here because that's awfully small. Um, and the rains, the waters receded from the earth continually, and at the end of 150 days, the water had abated, and on the seventh month, or the 17th day of the month, uh, the, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month of the 10th month. <laughs> Tenth month and the tenth, shoo, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. That's a long time to not see land. God remembers. God makes a wind. At the end of 150 days, let's take a look. God remembers Noah. He remembers all the beasts that are in the ark. All the livestock that were in the ark. God blots out all of the wickedness upon the earth. God remembers Noah and all the things. Now, the implication of remembers, is, as we look at it, is that God has forgotten about Noah. God has is so busy destroying the earth that Noah is just bouncing around upon the water like a bob in the water. and just Oh, look, there's Noah, and I've forgotten all about him. It's been 150 days. That's, that's not the phraseology. The, 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 um, a way to translate, if you want to smooth it away from, from the, the languages, God sets his affections again upon Noah. Grace is extended to Noah's family. Because here's the thing is, in the midst of the wrath of God being poured out upon all of the world, God extends his favor back to Noah. And to all that is in the ark. And not only does he return his grace or his, or his affection back to Noah. He then, to aid the, the recovery, he makes a wind. Why is, why is the wind important? This is a detail that, that actually has more substantive details under. Why is the wind important? What does wind do when blowing upon water? 
Well, it moves it, so the boat moves where it wants to go. What's another thing? If you, if you have water on the floor and you put a fan on it, what happens? It dries. Why is that important? Well, I've got an earth that's been saturated with water for 40 days of straight rain and then 150 days of no straight rain. And it takes months for it to fully recede. And part of the action in receding the water is the wind blowing upon it. And here you see again God's grace. And it's a small thing. You think about the smallness of wind until it's a hot, humid day and you're outside. And then, then you want wind. Or the artificial wind that is currently blowing in this room. Because it brings relief to the heat, but it also removes the water from the ground. And also guides the boat to the mountain where it rests. See, in the wind, God is still acting there and delivering the boat to where it needs to be and lowering the water. And notice the phraseology. The waters receded from the earth continually. The language is that is that it's a methodological and it's also programmed. It's also planned. It's also an event that is not outside the causal will of God. See, it's not something where God just goes... And then walks away from. You see that this, there's an intentionality of this. Just as there was an intentionality building up to this, there's also an intentionality leading away from this. And the waters continue to recede. Notice what happens. And at the end of 150 days, the waters abated on the, and on the 17th. I'm not going to read all that. We're going to get to here. And the waters continued until the tops of the mountains were seen. And that took some time before the tops are seen. And soon Noah will leave the ark. Now, why is this important? We skipped over that, and then you can go back and read it. It's not that it's not important, but for the purpose of this sermon, I chose to focus on the passage. Then Noah built an ark to the Lord and took some of the seven clean animals and some of every clean bird and offered them, uh, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. We'll talk about that. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time, harvest, cold heat, summer, winter, day, night shall not cease. What's the first thing Noah does when the ark stops? I tease by saying he plants a vineyard. That's not true. That was a joke. The first thing Noah does is he builds an ark. He reinstitutes the worship of the one true God with a sacrificial system. The very first thing he does when the door hits the ground is he has the presence of mind to worship the God who just obliterated everything that he knew and delivered the eight of them from that event. Let me ask you folks. What's the first thing you do when you come through a cataclysmic event? Do you worship a holy God who's led you through it? Or are you down in the mouth and mealy mouth about it? Noah recognized who did what and why he did what he did. And Noah recognized the evil of man's heart. Why? Because the text brings it up again. And the first thing Noah does when that ramp drops is he builds an altar. By the way, this is a common motif in the early part of Israelite literature. When they come across into the promised land, what's the first thing they do? They build an altar. And they sacrifice to God. What's the first thing we do? What's the first thing I do? That's kind of a convicting thing, though, isn't it? Because what Noah does is he thanks God for the deliverance and worships God for his being God in one act. And here's the thing is he takes from a very small pool Think about the pool he has of clean animals. He takes from a very small pool to begin with. And what does he do with the small pool? He takes from the things that he can eat. And he offers them to God. The very first thing he does. Let me ask you. 
ask us, do we do that? Is our worship when we come to God that way? Or are we more like Cain and and God gets something, but he doesn't get the best? Hearing the implication with Noah and it has parallels with what was Abel does. Noah doesn't play the game of, I'll give you something. Here's a soggy log, Lord. No. He takes from the store that he has, which is minimal. And he offers that. And notice, notice the language that's there. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. I don't know if any of you have ever smelled burning flesh. If you haven't, you will never forget that smell. There's nothing pleasing about that smell. There's nothing about it where you go, it's not like barbecue where you're slowly cooking the meat. Okay, because I can smell barbecue all day long. If they made a cologne that smelled like bacon and barbecue, I'm all about it. Stephanie may not be, but she's already contractually obligated to love me, so that doesn't really matter. And I'm not trying to attract you guys. So if I, you know, if I smell like bacon or barbecue, I'm, I'm down with that. that. That's slow, low and slow. Fires that consume sacrifices are not low and slow. That's usually the folks that like things well done. But this is a fresh killed animal and then you toss it upon the fire and it's going to smell. It's going to stink in our nose. So what makes it a fragrant aroma in the nostrils of God? The actual smell of the animal or the obedience of Noah to offer it? What makes it a fragrant aroma? The fact that one of the first thing, that the very first thing that Noah does is build an ark or build an altar and worship God there, and that is the aroma which God smells, and He smells and He sees and He realizes this is worship. When we come in here on Sunday morning, is our worship a fragrant aroma in the nostrils of the Lord, or is it an aroma? In the nostrils of the Lord. These are hard questions we have to ask ourselves. Why? Because the text makes some very strong indications that man's heart isn't fixed. Do you see that? Notice what God says. The Lord says in his heart. So he's talking to himself. I will never again curse the ground. So we think there's only one promise. That the rainbow gives us. That he'll never flood the earth again. There's actually due promises. If you're not an Italian, that would be two. Uh, two promises. The first one is, I will never what? I'll curse the ground because of man. How many times has this happened? Well, I'll tell you, it's happened twice. First time is when Adam and Eve sins. What's the first thing that he tells Adam? Cursed is the ground because of you. Then when Cain sins, what does God do again? He curses the ground. The ground in which you used to till that brings forth its fruit will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a wanderer and a vagabond. I will never again curse the ground. Why? Well, it's not the ground's fault. It's genuinely it's not the ground's fault. Neither will I wipe the earth clean again in this manner. He gives the implications of the manner in the next chapter, if you want to go read ahead. Now, why does he say this? Because he knows something about the heart of man. Man's heart is, what? Slightly good? Man's heart is basically good. You know, we're basically good people. Sure, 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 sure. sure. We, hey, I do some bad things. I, you know, I, I, I speed. I, I mean, you look at things I shouldn't look at. I, I, I might cheat on my dad. But it's, 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 I'm basically good. Is that, is that what God just said? That's not what God just said. And this is God speaking about us. Man's heart isn't bad Quasi-bad, semi-bad, makes mistakes, fails occasionally. Uh Uh-uh. That's not the language God uses. Man's heart 
is evil. The word translated here, youth, is really a mistranslation. It means from young life. Implication is from the time you're able to run around upon the earth, the heart of man is wicked. It's evil. But I thought I was good. Well, this is the Almighty God telling you what? You're not. This is why we gloss over this. Have you ever noticed that we gloss over these passages when we do the story of Noah? Because we all want to talk about the animals in the ark and how big the ark was and how much water was on the earth and how the water got on the earth because we want to cover up the ugly side of this passage. And the ugly side of this passage is that we as individuals are ugly things outside the grace of God. Noah was an ugly thing outside the grace of God. And it's the grace of God that spares Noah. It's the grace of God that spares us the curse of the ground continually. It's the grace of God that spares us from God saying, I have had it. Because you look at our culture today. God is not only right and just, but proper if he were to execute judgment now. And wipe us from the earth. And yet he has promised that he will not do so until he comes again. Folks, here's the scary thing about that. We are sitting on a ticking time bomb, and we have the good news of grace. We have the words of grace. We have the content of grace. It's in this text. But we also, as believers from this story and other stories throughout the Old Testament, also know that you have a holy God who is not playing when it comes to sin and evil and wickedness within the heart of man and every single one of us upon the earth are under ban of death because of that nature and it is only the grace of God that delivers us from it and we have that news and because God has been slow as some count slowness as Peter says we assume He's not going to bring judgment and wrath. That day is coming. It may not happen in my lifetime. It may not happen in my daughter's lifetime. Just because judgment is slow in coming does not mean judgment is not coming. And we have life-changing message that takes people from the assured destruction of being outside the ark to being inside the ark. Because the language in this text is dark, but so is the language in the text when it comes to Christ's return. And what are we doing with that grace? What am I doing with that grace? I challenge myself. Why? Because it's hard. Because, well, listen, I don't want to be made fun of. I already have enough. I already am, am, am worthy of being made fun of enough just on myself. I don't need to help this be made fun of. I don't want to be stumped by a question I can't answer. Notice one of the things I just said and showed you how to answer the objection of what kind of flood it is. This is what the text says. This is what I believe. And, and I'd like to talk to you more about the grace of a loving God because if you read these other passages, these are very succinct. And they are very, they are very full of details. And this is what will happen to you. Now, we don't want to try to scare people into heaven. But we also need to understand that that scary language should speed us and drive us. That when we encounter an individual, we let them know about the grace of God. When they reject, folks, listen, here's the thing is, if they reject, that's on them. The destruction that they, it comes to them is upon them. But if we don't say anything, then that rests on us too. This is what Ezekiel tells us. The watchman upon the wall cries out and the town refuses to listen. The town's death is not on the watchman, but the watchman sees them coming and says nothing. The death of the town is on the watchman. You're the watchman upon the wall. Have you cried out? In this passage, you see the wrath of God poured out upon all of mankind. And this is the language that is written in Romans. For the wrath of God is poured out upon mankind and all of its sins. 
thought we were going to escape that. And you got to read Romans. It's terrifying. And in that wrath is God's justice. And in that wrath is God is glorified. But in that wrath you also see God's grace. And the fact that he could have wiped clean the earth and started new. But yet he delivers a remnant. He starts fresh with eight men. Or four, sorry, four men and four, and four ladies. And the very first thing that man who found grace in the eyes of God did was worship a holy God. And that worship was a pleasing aroma in the nostrils of the Lord. What are we doing with the grace we have, knowing the cataclysmic danger that is going to befall the individual that we love or the people that we encounter, and the death that they will suffer is absolute? God is gracious. God is loving. And it is the grace of God that preserves us all from his wrath. But his wrath comes. What are we doing with the grace that God has given us? As the praise band comes and leads us this morning, I want to leave you with that thought. What are we doing with the grace that God has extended to us? Are we sharing that grace that we have with others to others? If you're here today and you would like to know more about this grace that is extended to the hearts of wicked man, I'd love to sit and talk with you here up front. I'd love to have a conversation with you. If you've been here today and you've been attending for a while and, you, and you've thought about making Skyline Baptist your home, I'd love to talk to you about what it takes to become a member here as well. As the praise band leads us in singing, if you will please stand. It's great to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning, and I uh, want to thank you for worshiping with us, those of us here and within the room, and those of us on the live stream. Uh, let's receive the benediction, and then I'll give us a couple announcements, and then we'll dismiss. Let us go down in the name of the Father, through the work of the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to take light in the darkness and hope to a hurting and dying world. Amen. If you'll please be seated, I'm going to rattle off a couple of quick announcements. Today is our business meeting, so I'm seeing that Mickey's hand is on the twelve. And on the 12. So when Mickey's hand gets to be on the 12 and the 10, or when I shut up and the 12 and whatever number that will be, we need to be back in here for the business meeting. Uh, so if we can do that, uh, please consult your bulletin for anything else that is in there. I didn't see anything that was like super overly pressing unless I've overlooked anything. And if that's the case, somebody will remind me. No. Okay, great. Again, it's great to have you in the house of the Lord this morning, and we thank you for your worshiping with us. Brother Robert, will you close us out with a word of prayer? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we, again, we come to you just for uh, many thanks that you uh, and blessings you bestow upon us. Father, we ask you to just go before us this week, make our path straight, Father. Uh, again, be with this country. We ask for safety, and we uh, hope and pray that we are pleasing what we say and do uh, for you this week. Know that we love you and ask forgiveness where we fail you. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.